The Templeton Twins by Ellis Weiner. Please turn to page 172 and 173 for chapter 13. When you hear the bell, be sure to go to the top of the next page to continue reading along. Let's begin. Chapter 13. Various Unexpected Things Occur. Dean D. Dean stood across from Professor Templeton, pointing the gun at him. John pretended to hobble over to where they stood. John, the professor cried, hurrying toward his son. Are you all right? You're hurt. I'm fine, Papa, John said. Where is Abigail? She got away, John said. He didn't enjoy lying to his father, but he decided that that wasn't exactly what he was doing. He was lying to the Dean twins. His father was an innocent bystander, an innocent listener, a bystanding li listener. Oh, never mind. Excuse me, Dean D. Dean said to his brother. She got away? It's not my fault, Dandy Dean said. Of course it is, John said. Who else's fault could it be? With his eyes rolled toward the sky and in a long suffering, this happened all the time tone. Dean Dee Dean asked his brother, where is she now? How should I know, Dandy Dean cried. I came outside and she was gone. He pointed to John. He was still here because he hurt his foot. She's getting the police, John said. Dandy Dean looked frightened and panicky. Dean, she's getting the police? Oh, don't be a big baby, his brother gestured in an open, innocent fashion to the woods all around them, as though to say, where we are doing nothing wrong. We are doing nothing wrong. What are we doing? We're standing here on a nice afternoon in the woods, chatting nicely and signing papers. What are we doing? That's not perfectly legal. Kidnapping isn't legal, John said. He's right, Dandy Dean cried. Kidnapping is against the law. Who said anything about kidnapping? Dean Dean said. You kidnapped us, John said. Dean Dean made a don't be absurd face and shook his head. Oh, please, he said. We don't, we did nothing of the kind. You, we came to your house and we took you and your sister for a visit to our house. That kind of thing happens all the time. What's the big deal? It's not all you did, John said. I, oh, all right, have it your way, Dean D. Dean said in a tone of voice that suggested he was trying very, very hard to be fair. We locked you in, a ba in the basement, so what? You got out, didn't you? So what's so kidnappy about that? You killed Nanny Nan, John said. Murder is against the law too. He's right, Dandy Dean cried. Murder is against the law. Honestly, Dee Dee Dean said, we didn't murder anyone. We tried to, yes. But we missed. No, she gave herself a heart attack. We just happened to be standing there. And so were you. And so was your sister. For that matter, he said, pointing to Casey, 
who had stretched out on the ground with her head up, looking at the surrounding woods with great interest. So was this dog. Are you going to put your dog in jail for murder? I don't think so. Dean Dee Dean waved the gun at the professor and at the papers. Sign them. Dean, Dandy Dean said, what if the girl does go to the police? Relax, his brother said. It'll take her all day. She'll have to hitchhike. And she doesn't know where we are anyway. The professor's face turned white with fear. He looked at Dean Dee Dean. Hitchhike? Abigail? Oh dear. John wanted to tell him not to be concerned that Abigail was at this that very moment hiding near the metallic blue car a hundred feet away. But of course he couldn't. The professor said in a frightening, frightening serious voice. If either of these children is hurt, you will regret this for the rest of your life. They're fine, Dean Dee Dean said. He pointed to John. Look, and the girl got away. The professor said to John, you're sure you're all right? John nodded. The professor, still worried, clamped his lips shut, put his glasses back on, and began reading the documents. John looked around. That's when he saw, lying nearby on the ground, a strange looking object. He knew immediately what it was. Yes, it was the personal one-man helicopter, P-O-M-H, prototype. The device was complete. The motor, the controls, the rotors, and of course, the knapsack. Just sign it, Dean Dee Dean said again. I told you, it's the usual thing. You share all ownership and profit with me. By share, in this case, I mean give all to me. I don't sign anything before I read it, the professor said. What if he doesn't sign it, John said. Dean Dee Dean went over to John and held up the gun for him to see. He said in a quiet, meanest voice, then someone might get hurt. It might be him, or it might be you. The professor looked up at Dean Dee Dean. There's a problem, he said. I can't sign this. Oh yes, you can, Dean Dee Dean said. And you're better, Mr. Professor Big Shot Templeton. I'm starting to lose my patience. No, I mean, I can't sign it, the professor said. I'm warning you. I mean, I don't have a pen. Dean Dee Dean started snapping his fingers at John and at Dan Dee Dean saying, pen, pen, pen. Somebody give him a pen. I don't have a pen, Dean, Dandy Dean said. How can you not have a pen? I just don't. You, Dean Dean said to John, you have a pen. You're a student. Students have pens. I don't have one, John said. And you flunked me, Dean Dean yelled at the professor. Why don't you try flunking your own son? He doesn't even have a pin. Perhaps you have one, the professor said. Oh, for goodness sakes, Dean Dee Dean said and slapped himself on the chest. Oh, as a matter of fact, I do. 
he reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a ballpoint pen. How about that? He laughed, ha ha, handing the pen to the professor. That's when they heard a car door slam shut. Everyone jumped. Dean D. Dean spun around and looked toward the black SUV. And beyond it, the metallic blue car. He turned to his brother and said, Check it out! Me? Why me? Because I'm witnessing the signature. Just do it! Dandy Dean looked nervous, but started walking toward the car. John took that opportunity to kneel down and to pretend to tie his shoe. Dandy Dean approached the black SUV wearily, but the more he looked it over, the more he relaxed. There was nothing amiss with it. Satisfied that it had not been a source of the sound, he turned his attention toward the metallic blue car. He approached the vehicle very slowly. Nothing seemed to be wrong. It was empty. All the doors were closed. Well, not quite. The lid of the trunk was half open. That made no sense. It looked suspicious. It looked wrong. Dandy Dean slowly walked along the passenger side of the car with his eyes fixed on the half open trunk. Suddenly, he leaped forward and flung the trunk completely open. Inside was an odd and unexpected thing. It was a pair of pink shoes. Dandy Dean bent over and reached out to pick them up. Check out the pictures in, in, in number one. Two. Number four, whack. He heard a vague, odd rustling as a shape emerged from underneath the car. Then the shape took a whack at his leg with something hard. And the next thing he knew, he was rolling on the ground in extreme pain. That was when John, having finished pretending to tie his shoes, grabbed a rock he had spotted on the ground, jumped up and slammed it down onto the gun hand of Dean D.D. The handsome man dropped the gun with a cry and John immediately fell on it as though it were a football or a rugby ball or some other kind of ball people fall on. Abigail ran up to them. She was holding her shoes, which she had retrieved from Dan that when Dandy Dean dropped them after she had whacked him in the leg with a tire iron from the trunk. Do you know what a tire iron is? In fact, it's, look, Never mind. Things are too, much too exciting for me to explain it now. Ask someone to tell you after we finish reading this book. Abigail put her shoes on. It worked, she said. Oh, please, Dean D. Dean said in a sort of tired, bored manner. He walked over to the professor and suddenly grabbed him whipped the professor's arm back behind his back and pressed his arm across the professor's throat. It didn't work. What are you going to do? Shoot your father? I don't think so. Give me that gun. Please click on part two.